Today's video was actually uploaded several months ago over on Sammy from Unicorn Dust Designs channel during her Spotlight series. However, I wanted to share these projects with you guys on my channel as well, as these are some of my all-time favorite projects that I'm really proud of. So some of you may have seen these already, but let's get into it. For this project, I cut down some scrap wood to create a frame. The base is just plywood, and for the frame, I cut down garden stakes that you can find at various retailers in the spring and summertime. I got mine from Dollar General, and then I mitered the corners so it fits together nicely. Then to attach the frame to the plywood, I'm using a combination of wood glue and brad nails. I wanted this to look like one solid piece, kind of like a shadow box, so I filled in all of the corners and seams where the frame meets the plywood with wood filler. This step is not necessary, but does add more of a finish, high-end look to your project. Once the wood filler was dry, I sanded it down and then painted the base. I'm using Fawn by Waverly. This is one of my all-time favorite colors for neutral home decor. Now we can start the fun part. Last year, I made a terracotta pot fence project and I wanted to do something similar on a larger scale. So I found these small terracotta pots at Lowe's and I wanted to cut them in half. I added a strip of masking tape right down the middle of the pot so I would know where to cut them, but also this is gonna help prevent chipping while cutting. This was actually really easy to do. I know it can look intimidating, but I used a Dremel with a cutting disc and slowly cut away at the pot going over and over the same line. You wanna make sure to wear safety glasses and a mask while doing this because the dust goes everywhere and you do not want to breathe that in. For an even easier method though, Sammy made a project a few months back cutting plastic nursery pots from the Dollar Tree in half and you will get the exact same look. Once they were cut, I placed them onto my wood frame and glued them down using a combination of my Starbond super glue in the medium formula and E6000. But the edges were not exactly flat against the frame, so I did add more E6000 into those gaps to fill them in where they didn't touch. Next, I'm taking a variety of river rock sizes and going to cover the surface of the wood. I had wanted larger, medium, and smaller size stones, but unfortunately, I could not find medium ones that matched what I was looking for until after I finished this project, of course. I got the smaller and the medium-ish rocks from Lowe's and the larger rocks from Walmart, but if you wanted to recreate this, I would recommend getting the medium-sized rocks at Hobby Lobby. They had the perfect ones for this. I started arranging the rocks using the largest ones first and then filling in all of the areas with the medium rocks. And to hold them in place, I used my E6000 glue. Once all of the larger and medium rocks were glued down, I added the small rocks to fill in any of the gaps. And this time it was easier to add the E6000 glue to the wood surface. And I let the glue dry overnight, then added some greenery into the pots. And that's it for this one. It is incredibly heavy. I don't plan on hanging this on my wall. I actually just created a gallery wall in my craft room to display some of my most favorite projects that I've made, plus a little spot for my son's artwork. But if you did recreate this and want to hang it, I would absolutely recommend using some heavy duty anchors to support this weight. For the second project, I found this oval mirror at a garage sale or the Goodwill bins last summer. It was less than $5 and the frame on this mirror is just beautiful. I love the detail and had this grand vision of what I wanted to do with this piece. Well, it went a little awry, so let me walk you through this. I removed the staples holding the backer and the mirror in place. So my plan was to age or antique a portion of this mirror. There's a hard coating on top of the mirror to protect it. And in order to age the mirror itself, you need to remove this coating. I have found that this citrus strip is the best method in removing the back of the mirror surface. I use a cheap paintbrush to spread it on and make sure to add a generous coat of the citrus strip. The bottle says to let it sit for at least 30 minutes. That was not quite long enough. The coating was not coming off as easy as it should. So I let it sit for another 30 minutes and that was perfect. 
this is what you want to see when you know the paint is ready to scrape off. It will look all rippled and bubbled up. And I used my Cricut scraper because I couldn't find my plastic scraper, but you do not want to use a metal scraper that could scratch the mirror surface, which will show through on the front. Next, I'm gonna start the antiquing process and in a spray bottle, I mixed together bleach and water. I did about one part bleach to three parts water and start spraying small sections of the mirror. This is still the back of the mirror where I removed the hard coating and then let that bleach water sit on the surface for a few minutes and then dab it off with a paper towel. This process requires a lot of patience. You want to gradually remove the mirror to make sure it turns out how you want. You can always remove more, but you cannot put it back. Here you can see how the mirror is being removed wherever that bleach water was sitting. So this is where I ran into an issue and not because I wasn't being patient. I knew this was going to happen where I didn't like a section of it and I tried to fix it and I tried to, and then I overcorrect it and then overdo it and then it's too much. This is such, <laughs> such a difficult process for me being a perfectionist because I just, I have a vision of exactly how I want it to look and distressing and making something look aged isn't something you can exactly perfect or you can't get like an identical look every time you do something. So what I need to do now is take all of the mirror surface off and get it down to the bare original glass. And I have mirror spray paint so I can still get that reflective original mirror surface back in that way, maybe. Hopefully I can control it a little bit better and make the areas that I want to be mirror and the areas that I don't want there to be mirror to come through a little bit better for how I was envisioning. I wanted a design to be peeking through the aged part of the mirror and I thought this floral napkin was perfect. So since I removed all of the mirror surface, I figured out what parts of the napkin I want to show through. And then using a small paintbrush dipped in water, I outline the sections that I want. This helps to easily rip the napkin right exactly where you want it. And then I placed the glass back on top of the napkin and drew a line with a chalk marker where the napkin edges are. That way I can tape off this section and not get the mirror spray paint on it. The directions on this spray paint say to shake it for two minutes really well and then spray five individual coats of paint waiting one minute in between. I went over all of the edges where my tape is with a damp paper towel to give a faded look so it wouldn't have that harsh line when I take the tape off. And I repeated this with each coat of spray paint. Now I'll admit I'm not a huge fan of the way the spray paint turned out. However, it does add to the overall vintage look that I'm going for with this project. The mirror surface is a little more speckled and blurry looking, not as clear and reflective as a traditional mirror would be. To add to the aged look even more, I'm taking this bronze patina paint by Dixie Belle and dabbed it around the edges where there is no mirror. And then to add the napkin, I used a thin layer of Mod Podge only over top of the napkin, not underneath to decoupage the napkin down. I didn't want it to distort the napkin look from the front and be able to see that Mod Podge. Has anyone ever tried the DIY paint liquid patina as a decoupage medium? Let me know down in the comments what you think about it. I have heard it is much nicer to work with than Mod Podge and I really want to give it a try. When the Mod Podge dried, I took sandpaper to the edges to tear off any of the excess napkin. For the frame, I sanded it down so the paint would stick better and gave it a coat of slick stick and then two coats of Rust-Oleum chalk paint and linen white. I wanted the frame to tie into the mirror, so I took the bronze paint again and added it to the raised section, bordering that twist detail. Then to distress this area, I took a chippy brush with my white paint to go over the bronze. And I used a very, very tiny bit of paint on my brush to do this. I did the same thing with the bronze paint and dry brushed it over the twist detail. I think this looks so beautiful and ties the two pieces together. 
I don't like a lot of distressing, but I thought this piece needed it. So I took some sandpaper and very lightly distressed the outside frame detail. So this part didn't look too new and distressing is such a personal preference. If you like a heavy distress, by all means take off even more paint. So after looking at the mirror for several days, I really was not happy with how it turned out and headed back to the thrift store to find a new one. I did the same process in removing the hard coating and antiqued the mirror. This time I added about half and half bleach to water and that helped remove the mirror a little quicker. This one was turning out much better. Once I was happy with the mirror, I mod podged the napkin down and instead of using bronze on the frame for this one, I used burlap also by Dixie Belle. I'm so glad that I went back and recreated this project because the second one is exactly what I was envisioning with the spotted distressed look. Here's how the first one turned out. I don't hate it, but I also don't love it. I much prefer the second version. For this next one, we're heading to the thrift store. I absolutely love this place. There is so much hidden treasure everywhere you look. There's just things piled up everywhere. And I found this salad bowl set. I shared it a few months ago in a haul, but knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. I paid $8 for this set and I'm going to show you two ways to make a trendy planter just in case you can't find stackable salad bowls. I wanted to cut the bottom out of three of the five bowls. This isn't necessary if you just wanna put a fake plant or succulents in here, but just to have the option for a larger plant, I did cut them out. And to do that, I used my Dremel. I bought this router guide attachment, which honestly, I don't think it helped at all, but definitely could have been user error. Next, I glued three bowls together and then two bowls together for a set using my E6000 glue and let that dry overnight. There were a few gaps around where the bowls meet, so I used caulk to fill them in and make this look like one piece. To get the caulk smooth, wet your finger and wipe it across the seam. Less is definitely more here. Once the caulk was dry, I gave the bowl a scuff sand and then a coat of slick stick. These bowls look like a mahogany or a very red type of wood, and I didn't want there to be bleed through. That would have caused a lot of extra work and then I painted the planters with two coats of Sandcastle by Dixie Bell. The inside where I cut the bowls was pretty jagged. I should have sanded this down sooner, but I just took my Dremel with a sanding disc to smooth it out. I've been finding a lot of uses for this Dremel tool lately, and I highly recommend you have one in your arsenal. The last step for this version is to spray a coat of textured spray paint for a little more detail with this Rust-Oleum Stone Spray Paint in Bleached Stone. Before I share the reveal of this one, let me show you the second way to make this using Dollar Tree supplies. I've had these pole noodles for at least a year now from the Dollar Tree, but now that they've raised their prices, you can find pole noodles cheaper at Walmart if you want to save yourself some pennies. I cut the noodles into smaller sections with a box cutter and then cut that section in half and then cut each half in half again. Then I'm going to attach them to a hurricane glass vase. This was a little tricky. I knew I didn't want to use hot glue because it doesn't stick to glass long term. I wanted to use E6000, but that doesn't stick right away to hold the shape. I tried adding some rubber bands around the noodle to hold it in place, but that was an epic fail and didn't work whatsoever. So instead I decided to hot glue the pole noodle closed in the back, but you do have to be careful here. The hot glue will melt your pole noodle. I repeated this all the way up the vase and then I painted the noodles with gesso to prime them in two coats of the sandcastle paint. I wanted to do the same texture spray paint and top, but you cannot spray paint foam. It will just eat away at it. So I added a coat of Mod Podge to act as a sealer before going in with the spray paint. I don't see the texture as much on this version, but the speckles are there at least. And that's it for this version, super easy. I prefer the look of the salad bowls, but let me know what you think. For the last project, I saw this macrame air plant hanger on Pinterest and I wanted to recreate it. 
To start out, I drew a very rough sketch to see how much cord I needed, and I used the golden roll of macrame to figure out the cord length. So for the golden roll, you take the length of the knot portions and you multiply that by four, and then multiply that by two because the cords will be folded in half. If you want fringe or a tassel, take the length you want that to be and multiply by two. I don't have fringe on this piece, but I did have a small area of straight unknotted cord, so I rounded up my measurement. It's better to have more cord than to run out. I have definitely been in that situation before. So I cut four pieces of two millimeter macrame cord to 150 inches each. Next, I'm attaching the cord to a wood ring that I get from Amazon with a lark's head knot. You fold one cord in half and then it take the loop where it's folded through the ring and pull the ends of the cord through the loop and do that for all four cords. I space the cords out evenly around the ring and tape it down so I can work on one section at a time without it moving around on me. For this part, I'm making a cross knot. So take your cords and make a four, crossing the left cord over the right. Then bring the left cord behind the right and back to the left, creating an S. If you're a beginner at macrame, tape down the left cord at this point to help it from moving around. And then take the end of the right cord and put it behind and through the top loop. Then pull it down through the bottom loop of the S and pull that tight. I repeated this two more times, creating three cross knots and did the same on all four cord sections. Once I have all of my knots, I'm taking a six inch embroidery hoop and use just the inside of it. I need to see where I want the wood ring to sit inside of the embroidery hoop. And then I cut down another strand of macrame cord, roughly about 30 inches to create a wrap and I'm holding all of the cords together where I want the wrap to start and place the new cord on top. Make a loop with the new cord longer than you want the wrap section to be, and then start wrapping all of the cords, including the loop. When the wrap is as long as you want it, I did less than an inch, take the end of the wrapping cord and put it through the loop. Then go back to the top of the wrap where the end of the cord is sticking out and pull that tight. This is going to create a knot at the bottom and conceal it inside of the wrap for a nice clean look and then cut off the ends. Now to add this section to the embroidery hoop, I split the cord in half. So four are on one side and four on the other. Then I made square knots as the hanger part. This is one of the basic macrame knots and I only used two of the eight cords. The rest will be inside of the knot. To make the square knot, take the left cord and make a four over top of the inside cords, but pull the right cord on top of the straight section. Then take the right cord behind and through the opening of the four. This is half of the square knot, so you want to repeat it going the opposite direction, starting with the right cord and make a backwards four, and pulling the left cord behind and through. I repeated this until I had 12 inches of square knots. And to finish the hanger, I took another wood ring and pulled all of the cords through it. I cut one last piece of cord to make another wrap and that finished off this hanger.